If we can take our seats, we'll begin. First of all, a, a warm welcome this evening, especially to our guests who are attending uh, the lecture uh, this evening. So welcome to Notre Dame Seminary. We're glad to have you here uh, with us. So let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Teach me, my Lord, to be sweet and gentle in all the events of life, in disappointments, in the thoughtfulness of others, in the thoughtlessness of others, in the sincerity and the insincerity of those I trusted, in the unfaithfulness of those on whom I relied. Let me put myself aside to think of the happiness of others, to hide my little pains and heartaches so that I may be the only one to suffer them. Teach me to profit by the suffering that comes across my path. Let me so use it that it may mellow me, not harden or embitter me, that it may make me patient, not irritable, that it may make me broad in my forgiveness, not narrow, haughty and overbearing. May no one be less good for having come within my influence, no one less pure, less noble for having been a fellow traveler in our journey toward eternal life. As I go my rounds from one distraction to another, let me whisper from time to time a word of love to you. May our life be lived in the supernatural, full of power for good, and strong in its purpose of sanctity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's now my pleasure to introduce you Dr. David Liberto as he introduces this evening for us. Good evening and thank you for coming. Before I give a little history to this lecture series, I do want to mention that we are going to have a Q&A session directly after the lecture. We have a live mic here, and if you would come to the middle aisle to the microphone, and please limit it to one question. In the spring of 2005, Notre Dame Seminary started what is called the Aquinas Lecture Series. The faculty instituted this lecture in order to complement the Fall Lecture Series, which is now known as the Monsignor Terry Teacup Lecture Series. Where the TCAP lecture series is more general in scope, inviting scholars from various theological disciplines, the Aquinas lecture was intended to invite scholars whose work made important contributions to Thomistic theology or philosophy. It is clear that a lecture series dedicated to the thought of the angelic doctor is most fitting, especially within seminary education. The church has made it clear whether we examine Pope Leo XIII's Eterni Patris or Pope John Paul II's Fides et Ratio, the Magisterium has singled out the teaching of St. Thomas as a sure guide in pursuing truth. Listen to the words of Pope Leo XIII, who wrote of the angelic doctor. With his spirit at once humble and swift, his memory ready and tenacious, his life spotless, throughout, a lover of truth for its own sake, richly endowed with human and divine science. Like the sun, he heated the world with the warmth of his virtues and filled it with the splendor of his teaching. The Second Vatican Council was also clear as to the important role that Thomas's thought should play in the theological formation of seminarians. The, the decree on priestly formation reads, in order that they may illumine the mysteries of salvation as completely as possible, the students should learn to penetrate them more deeply with the help of speculation under the guidance of St. Thomas and to perceive their interconnections. At Notre Dame Seminary, we take this charge very seriously. The Aquinas Lecture provides an important opportunity for our, for our students and faculty to probe more deeply into the thought of the angelic doctor. This lecture series has included a who's who of Thomistic scholars. Some of our past presenters include notables such as 
Father Norris Clark, Father Benedict Ashley, Father Brian Davis, Father Lawrence Dewan, Monsignor John Whipple, Professor Stephen Long, and Professor Edward Fazer. This year's presenter adds yet another excellent scholar to our distinguished list. Here to formally introduce our speaker is our own Professor Jordan Haddad. Thank you, Dr. Liberto. Good evening, everyone, and again, thank you for joining us for our Spring 2023 Aquinas Lecture. It's with great pleasure and it's a great honor that I was invited by Dr. Liberto to introduce our esteemed lecturer this evening, Dr. Reinhard Huter. Dr. Huter studied theology, philosophy, and German literature and philology at the University of Erlangen, the University of Bonn, and Duke University. He received his MDiv equivalent, best of class, from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bavaria in 1986. He graduated with his Doctor of Theology, summa cum laude, in 1990, in his Habilitation in 1995 from the University of Erlangen. He is a faculty fellow of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America, an ordinary academician of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, a member of the International Theological Commission from 2021 through 2026, and a professor of fundamental and dogmatic theology at the Catholic University of America since 2016. His teaching and research focus on fundamental theological questions, particularly the interplay between faith and reason, nature and grace, revelation and faith, theology and philosophy, and dogma and history. Professor Hooter is the author of numerous books, most recently, Dust Bound for Heaven, Explorations in the Theology of Thomas Aquinas, 2012, Bound for Beatitude, A Thomistic Study in Eschatology and Ethics, 2019, Aquinas on Transubstantiation, The Real Presence of Christ in the Eucharist, 2019, and most recently, his Newman and Us, A Guide for Our Times, 2020. I was fortunate to study under Dr. Hooter while at CUA from fall 2016 through spring 2018. My classmates and I, some of whom are here with us today, have very fond memories of exhilarating three-hour seminars discussing the thought of many of the most esteemed representatives of the Catholic theological tradition, all with one of the greatest Catholic theologians alive today. One uniquely significant moment in my theological studies was a weekly seminar on Matthias Joseph Schaben with Dr. Hooter where we would gather weekly in his home to enjoy coffee, tea, and fellowship, all the while reading and discussing the newly translated book one of Shaben's Handbook of Catholic Dogmatics. Dr. Hooter is a great scholar, an inspiring Catholic man of faith, and a cherished mentor. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Reinhard Hooter to the podium to offer our spring 2023 Aquinas Lecture. I have to change glasses now. I learned recently a new verb. It's called olding. <laughs> Some of you in the audience know it. Um, that means I don't see you now anymore, but I see my text. That's what's happening now. So I'm still relatively new to that exercise. Trifocals are beyond me, so. Uh, <laughs> I have to have my text in front of me. It surely is a great honor and joy to be here. I've enjoyed the hospitality and fellowship already greatly. Uh, I love the place, and seminaries make me extremely happy. I, I spent time at Mandelein Seminary earlier, and coming here, it's the same sense of being in the right place. Everything is ordered in the right direction, starting with Mass at the, in the morning. And, and seeing you all here, this is, this is wonderful. And some of my students from COA and colleagues, it's a great honor to be here, especially um, on this occasion of the annual Aquinas Lecture. The topic for this evening is Thomas Aquinas on original justice, happiness, and friendship 
with God. It will get a little bit Thomistic at some point, just as a warning, but only further down. We are starting out a bit in a wider horizon. It is an uncontroversial fact that the Catholic Church as a whole is still very much living in the process of receiving the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. The Council's longest and in certain ways most complex document is the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Space. And its arguably most famous passage is Gaudium et Space 22. Christ being the full revelation of man to man himself, as the English translation puts it. This is what the Council Fathers state. Quote, the truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who was to come, namely Christ the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. He who is the image of the invisible God is himself the perfect man. To the sons of Adam he restores the divine likeness which had been disfigured from the first sin onward." Unquote. According to the Council Fathers, in accord with the witness of the Holy Scriptures and of tradition, Christ's redemptive work is a work of restoration. Christ restores the divine likeness disfigured from the first sin onward. Yet any restoration presupposes something lost and in need of restoration. In the case of Christ's redemptive restoration of our divine likeness, what is presupposed is an original state that antecedes the first sin, the disfigurement of the divine likeness. This evening, I wish to offer some theological reflections on a few aspects of Thomas Aquinas' subtle and complex account of this original state of inchoate divine likeness. Medieval theologians used as a technical term for this original state Justitia originalis, original justice or righteousness. Not only was St. Thomas the one medieval theologian who treated this topic most extensively, but he also initiated a theological tradition that reaches into the 19th and 20th century. One only needs to read the dogmatic theologies of the leading 19th century German theologian, his name was already mentioned, Matthias Joseph Schaben, and of the 20th century Francophone Swiss theologian, Charles Cardinal Journey. This tradition takes the human being in the original state as what I will call from now on in the lecture, the homo supernaturalis, the primordial reference point in the beginning for Christ's redemptive work of restoration. The via salutis, the way of salvation, does not begin with an always already fated fallenness addressed and overcome eventually by Christ, but rather with a homo supernaturalis, original humanity created in the divine likeness and in primordial inchoate friendship and communion with God. The original homo supernaturalis is the correlate to the new Adam, Christ, the incarnate Logos, the God-man, or Theos Aner, who restores the lost divine likeness to us. Without original humanity, that is the figure of him who was to come, the first sin, that is the fall, and the subsequent disfigurement of humanity by original sin and actual sins, either hangs suspended in thin air, and therefore eventually comes to denote an always extant common predicament. Absent the homo supernaturalis, an alternative scenario begins to invade and occupy the Christian imagination in the modern period. Humanity emerging through an evolutionary process 
from a long line of biological ancestors and carrying in its genes, instincts, and neurological constitution the conditions for the possibility of survival and of species flourishing, all the necessary characteristics of a super predator who eventually conquered the planet. In this alternative scenario, the fall is at best simply a mythopoetic symbolization of humanity as such in the ongoing process of its evolution, always caught in the ambiguities between good and evil, that is between the advantageous and the harmful, in regard to its flourishing, always aware of its finitude and living within the horizon of death, that is always in anticipation of one's own death, dominated by unruly instincts and passions, infinite desires, the will to power, and the inherent inconsistency of one's own willing. All of this understood as the natural condition of the human being, as an advanced super primate in the evolving process of the species. In such a scenario, Christ does not restore anything but rather, at best, announces the future divine humanity to come by way of a purportedly civilizing evolution of human values. Christ, the moral paradigm of a kingdom of universal love, of a definitive rule of justice and peace on earth and with all of creation. In this scenario, Christ, through his life and witness, announces and anticipates a future divine likeness. Yet, quite obviously, he does not restore anything that once obtained. To put it differently, in this scenario, there is no redemptive work of Christ. I cannot repress at this point a striking line from the well-known 20th century Protestant theologian H. Richard Niebuhr, the brother of the even more famous Reinhold Niebuhr, a line that fittingly unmasks the theological deficit of this alternative scenario. Quote, a God without wrath brought man without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the, through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross." Unquote. Such a revisionist account of Christ's saving work seems to exert a considerable attraction on contemporary revisionist theology. With the past having been occupied by evolutionary science, so to speak, all that seems to be left for theology is the future. Yet this is a dangerous illusion, because without a distinct salvation historical beginning, there is no terminus a quo that would give orientation to a terminus ad quem. Emergentism would make Christ himself the figure of some future God-man, the typos of a future antitypos still to arrive. Yet such a construal would flatly contradict the web of salvation history between the primordial past of a definite terminus a quo and the promised future of a terminus ad quem, the center of both being Christ, all unequivocally affirmed by Gaudium at Space 22. Christ's mission is to restore the likeness of God, yet a restoration presupposes a loss or a privation and an original state in which the divine likeness obtained. Thomas Aquinas sees God's original intention and humanity's original state theologically expressed in Nuce in Ecclesiastes 7.30, God made man right. Quod feci Deus hominem rectum. God created humanity in perfect rectitude, and that is, in divine likeness. This original divine likeness is present in original humanity as the closest possible initial union with its supernatural end, God, and that initial union with God issues happiness and bliss. The human nature, rightly ordered interiorly and as a whole to God, and living in an inchoate communion with God by way of faith, hope, and charity, in short, in friendship with God, the closest possible communion with God, short of the beatific vision. 
This is the theological vision of the original state Aquinas proposes, in a nutshell. And I would like to submit it is nothing less than a theological proposal like this one that Gaudium et Space 22 stands in need of in order to undergird its central Christological claim. At this point, a little interlude, and I'm going to turn for a moment to John Henry Newman. At this point, it is opposite to name what has become the probably greatest difficulty for a recovery of the theological truth St. Thomas intends with his account of what I call in the following the original homo supernaturalis. St. John Henry Newman, in a prescient chapter called A Form of Infidelity of the Day, of his rightly famous The Idea of a University, called this obstacle, quote, the special effect of modern sciences upon the imagination, prejudicial to revealed truth, unquote. Let me quote John Henry Newman somewhat at length. He could have written these lines yesterday, and they pertain directly to our topic at hand. Quote Newman. There are those enemies of the faith and of the church who hope, there are those who are sure that in the incessant investigation of facts, physical and political and moral, something or other or many things will sooner or later turn up and stubborn facts too, simply contradictory of revealed declarations. A vision comes before the faithful, these enemies would anticipate of some physical or historical proof that mankind is not descended from a common origin or that the hopes of the world were never consigned to a wooden ark floating on the waters or that the manifestations on Mount Sinai were the work of man or nature or that the Hebrew patriarchs or the churches of Israel are mythical personages or that St. Peter had no connection with Rome or that the doctrine of the Holy Trinity of the real presence was foreign to primitive belief. In the roughly 170 years since Newman originally wrote these lines, these claims have been not only posited by historical critical exegetes, by paleoanthropologists and by paleogeneticists, rather they also have become established prejudices informing countless novels, movies and other popular media and hence exercise a formidable influence on the public imagination, increasingly prejudicial regarding revelation as conveyed by the inspired scriptures. And so continues Newman, quote, these enemies of the faith trust to the influence of the modern sciences on what may be called the imagination. When anything which comes before us is very unlike what we commonly experience, we consider it on that account untrue, not because it really shocks our reason as improbable, but because it startles our imagination as strange. While reason and revelation are consistent in fact, they often are inconsistent in appearance, and this seeming discordance acts most keenly and alarmingly on the imagination, and may suddenly expose a person to the temptation and even hurry him on to the commission of definite acts of unbelief in which reason itself really does not come into the exercise at all. I mean, let a person devote himself to the studies of the day, let him take in and master the vastness of the view thus afforded him of nature, its infinite complexity, its awful comprehensiveness, and its diversified yet harmonious coloring, and then when he has for years drank in and fed upon this vision, let him turn round to, per to peruse the inspired records or listen to the authoritative teaching of Revelation, the book of Genesis, or the warnings and prophecies of the Gospels. And he may certainly experience a most distressing revulsion of feeling, not that his reason really deduces anything from his much-loved studies contrary to the faith, but that his imagination is bewildered and swims with a sense of the ineffable distance 
of that faith from the view of things which is familiar to him with its strangeness and then again its rude simplicity as he considers it and its apparent poverty contrasted with the exuberant life and reality of his own world, unquote. I just love to quote Newman. He's so much better than oneself, so one best spends time quoting Newman. Don't worry, I continue and come to Thomas Aquinas very soon. About 170 years after Newman described this widespread dynamic with striking accuracy, the contemporary popular imagination is informed by the materialist imminent frame of an a teleological evolutionary process in which the only fleeting teleology is the one created by the de facto desires and longings that drive the individual human being. An imagination shaped in such a way can receive Genesis 3 at best as a quasi-philosophical myth, analogous maybe to the myth in Plato's Timaeus, or worse, something along the lines of Tolkien's Silmarillion, a culturally fascinating but purely literary etiological narrative of origins and failures, of good and evil, undoubtedly a treasure of primitive religio-cultural human ingenuity, but nothing more than that for sure. This collective imagination informed by secular, scientific, and, and immanentist presuppositions and prejudices has been clashing increasingly with the scriptural and theological imagination that Gaudium et Space 22, and especially also Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum 11 through 13, enjoin us to develop. An imagination informed by the reading of the Holy Scriptures through the eyes of faith, with a strong expectation that while inconsistent in appearance, reason and faith will turn out to be consistent in fact. As the Council Fathers remind the faithful in Dei Verbum 11, I have to bring that before your eyes, quote, those divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in sacred scripture have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For Holy Mother Church, relying on the belief of the apostles, holds that the books of both the Old and New Testaments are in their entirety, with all their parts, are sacred and canonical, because written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself. In composing the sacred books, God chose men and while employed by him, they made use of their powers and abilities so that with him acting in them and through them, they as true authors consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. Therefore, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation." Unquote. The teaching of Dei Verbum 11 is the positive aspect of which a little-known statement of Aquinas is the corresponding negative aspect. St. Thomas departs from his restrained rhetoric and consistently formal discussion in Summa Theologiae 1-2, Prima Secundi, question 103, article 4, responds to the second objection and states there quite directly that it is wicked, nefas, to believe that there is something false in the canonical scriptures. Nefas est credere aliquid esse falsum in canonica scriptura. Let me point out three crucial presuppositions held by Aquinas and largely shared by Dei Verbum as entailments of the affirmations just quoted. These presuppositions support the formation of a properly formed scriptural and theological imagination that is able to receive in an, un in, in an uninhibited and undistorted way the salvation historical fact of the homo supernaturalis. 
First, Aquinas takes it for granted that the original state, as well as its loss, and all that this loss entails, and finally what the overcoming of this loss, human redemption means and entails, can only be known about by way of divine revelation and its inspired record, the canon of the Holy Scriptures. The decrees of the divine will and their execution can be known in no other way than by way of God's own communication, that is, by way of revelation and received by faith. The only one that knows revelation, to use the apt expression of Romano Guardini, conveys through the inspired scriptures, here specifically Genesis 3, by way of the literary genres used in their respective composition, that truth which God wanted to put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation, as the Verbum 11 puts it. And it is this that should inform the theological imagination in a fundamental and primary way. Second, biblical typology. Here specifically the Adam Christ typology of Romans 5 discloses the theological significance of correlated figures and events of salvation history. It seems to be an inescapable entailment of the, literal, of the literal sense of Romans 5 that the Adam referred to is as much a fact of salvation history as the Christ that is referred to is. Gaudium at Space 22 seems to agree implicitly with this supposition. An exclusive reading of Adam as the, as the collective personality representing humanity as a whole, or Israel in particular, would open the legitimate question why such an exclusive collective reading should not obtain also for Christ as the collective personality of the new Adam, representing the new humanity as a whole gathered as the ecclesial body of Christ. Todus Adam and Todus Christus. In both cases, a salvation historical meaning unmoored from its referent, a specific salvation historical fact. It is difficult, if not impossible, to sustain such an interpretation without gravely distorting, if not simply undercutting, the overall Christology and Soteriology that governs the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. While the Adam Christ typology can arguably be also read with an inclusive meaning, connoting in each case also a collective personality, such a reading has to presuppose, nevertheless, the facticity and unique salvation historical role of each pole of the typology, Adam as well as Christ. Third, the fall is by implication of the very, of the very theological logic of the Adam Christ typology to be understood as a salvation historical event and not as a mere etiological myth conveying a salvation historical meaning. It is far from impossible for the salvation historical event also to serve an etiological function. Yet it is from the former, the salvation historical event with universal impact for the entire human family that the latter, the salvation historical meaning, arises. It is hard to see how one can save the latter, the meaning, while dispensing with the former, the salvation historical fact. The mytho-poetical narrative of the sin of the first parents presupposes necessarily an antecedent state superior to the post-fall state, however construed in detail some gratuitous state of proximate perfection of human existence, short of the beatific vision, spiritually, intellectually, volitionally, and physically. Since the fall is primarily an estrangement from God, the prior state has to be conceived as a state characterized by right relation with God, indeed by friendship with God, in short, as a state of original justice. But from the beginning it was not so, Matthew 19, 8. I submit that St. Thomas conceives of what I shall call the homo supernaturalis 
as the theological truth that the canonical scriptures convey, Genesis 3 and Romans 5, read in light of the mystery of Christ. And that is the incarnation. He takes the state of original justice and the fall to be salvation historical events, not unlike the calling of Abraham, Israel's liberation from bondage in Egypt and wandering the desert for 40 years, the calling of the prophets, the birth of Christ, his ministry, passion, death and resurrection, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. There might be quite a considerable distance of time between all these events, but that distance is a matter of quantity, not of quality. Let's turn now to the topic of perfect humanity in the original state, we are focusing in. Because the whole divine economy of salvation as conveyed by divine revelation presupposes it, Aquinas considers carefully the original state of the first human beings. They are, as we all have heard and learned, constituted as rational animals by receiving from God as the substantial form of their body a rational soul that is an incorruptible spiritual substance that distinguishes human beings as species from all other animals, including from what later theologians would have called pre-Adamites and what now might be called pre-human ancestors that is, from all hominids. Aquinas takes original justice to denote a state marked by full harmony and right order in relationship to God, to creation, to the other, and to oneself. First, human couple was subject to God and open to God's promptings. Without the human being, within the human being, the different powers of the lower soul, the sensitive powers with, which pertain to sensation, and the emotions were subject to the rule of reason, and the mind and the will were subject to God. This ordo justitiae, this original ordered rightness, was gratuitously bestowed by God so that the human being would be primordially in the right relationship with God, not only qua person, but also in regard to specific human nature as a whole in its own interior constitution and in relation to God. As St. Thomas stresses in his account in the Summa Theologiae, original justice is not a property simply inherent to human nature, but is rather gratuitous, an additional gift bestowed freely by God on created human nature as a whole and not individually on the first human being qua person. In the Prima Paris of the Summa, question 100, article 1, Aquinas puts the matter quite explicitly. Quote, Original justice, in the rectitude of which the first human being was made, was an accident, accident contrasted with substance here, belonging to the nature of the species, not in the sense that it was caused by the principles of the species, but in the sense that it was a special gift given by God to the nature as a whole, unquote. And later in the Summa Prima Secunde, first of the second question, 81, Article 2, St. Thomas states that, quote, original justice was a particular gift of grace divinely bestowed upon all human nature in the first parent." Unquote. Hence, according to Aquinas, original justice is not something owed by God to the constitution of human nature itself. Original justice is therefore emphatically not to be understood as a property belonging to human nature as such, so that its loss would cripple human nature in such an irreversibly detrimental way that bereft of original justice, human nature would become inherently deficient and its powers intrinsically skewed. Rather, original justice is a pure gratuity, an accident given to human nature that perfects it on its natural level. 
It is a help, auxilium, granted by God to human nature to set its highest power, reason, and will in right relation to God and thereby to overcome the defects that are co-natural to human nature as composed of body and rational soul. It's an unstable union. And Thomas argues that God stabilizes that composite reality through the gratuitous gift of original justice. In the first part of the Summa Question 97, Article 1, Aquinas argues that the indissolubility of the body of original humanity was not due to some intrinsic vigor of immortality that the body had, unlike the resurrection body, but, quote, by reason of a supernatural force given by God to the soul, in erat anime vis quedam supernaturale de divinitus data, whereby it was able to preserve the body from all corruption so long as it, the soul, remained itself subject to God. Unquote. This is a very important point I shall return to later. The root cause of paradise is the quasi-supernatural strength given by God to the soul as such, that is, to the nature of original humanity in the state of original justice due to the perfect submission of mind and will to God, a quasi-supernatural strength that would radiate through the whole human body-soul composition and in this way, so to speak, constitute paradise. To put it differently, the homo supernaturalis cannot walk out of paradise like out of a garden. Rather, wherever the homo supernaturalis is, there is paradise. The homo supernaturalis can only lose paradise, but not go out of it geographically. The root, radix, in Latin, of the state of paradise is the gift of justitia originalis, and the loss of the latter is identical with the loss of the former, the state of paradise with all its preternatural entailments. The important notion, I come back to that in a minute, the important notion for Thomas and Thomas of integral nature denotes human nature from its very beginning equipped with original justice and refers to the total natural and preternatural equipment in its integral order, intrinsically and especially toward God, that original humanity received, yet abstracting from sanctifying grace. Theoretically abstracting from sanctifying grace, bracketing sanctifying grace. And now we get for a little moment into real Thomistic waters. With his last observation, we have reached the crucial question pertaining to the theologically relevant constitution of original humanity. Namely, what is the relationship exactly between original justice, the gift to the nature, and sanctifying grace? It is complex, to say the least. Aquinas has not been fully explicit about this relationship, and so it has given rise to elaborate discussions among students and interpreters of Aquinas, and I will spare you with a long version of the story of that. Uh, it seems to me, though, that Conan Gallagher, in his 1966 CUA doctoral dissertation, a brilliant piece of work, drawing upon the important work of Prudentius de Lerre, a Jesuit, uh, who has been unjustly forgotten and is re being rediscovered. He has written in the Thomist. He was a Jesuit Thomist, has achieved a superior synthesis that in the following I shall make my own. Gallagher, transcending the competing Thomist positions of essentialism, that was one major position, namely that sanctifying grace and the original justice are adequately distinct, they're really distinct from each other, and the other position called formalism, Sanctifying grace and original justice are only inadequately distinct. Gallagher interprets, in my eyes, accurately 
Aquinas his own mature position as one in which the relationship between sanctifying grace and original justice is conceived as a paradigmatic case of the reciprocal form matter causality with God being the efficient cause of both the form and the matter. Form would be sanctifying grace, matter, original justice. Since Gallagher's excellent study is not easy to access, it was never published as a book, I shall indulge your patience by citing a crucial passage at length. He puts it very clearly, the matter. Quote, Sanctifying grace, since it is a created participation in the divine nature and exceeds the order of nature, is something extraneous to human nature. In fact, it raises human nature to a higher order, that is, the order of the supernatural. As such, it necessarily is an endowment of an individual nature, that is, of the person. Sanctifying grace, since it is extraneous to human nature, cannot be given to the nature considered in itself. The specific and common nature could not receive such a perfection without this perfection entailing a change in the species. Human nature is simply and absolutely incapable of receiving a perfection of this type and still remain human nature. Only a nature as subsistent, that is the person, is capable of receiving such a perfection. On the basis of the extraneous nature of sanctifying grace, then, we must exclude it from, inhe from inhering in the specific or common nature and maintain that it inheres in the person as in its proper subject. And by doing so, it qualifies the entire supposit that is the person. So much as pertains to sanctifying grace, but what about original justice? Original justice though a preternatural good is nothing more or nothing less than integ integrity of nature. As such, original justice excludes from its essential composition sanctifying grace. Looked at essentially, original justice is original justice considered in itself independently of grace. Sanctifying grace is not the formal determining element of original justice accounting for its being, but sanctifying grace is related to original justice as a formal cause. Subtle Thomas distinction. Formal cause. Certainly not in the sense of an intrinsic determining element establishing the essence of original justice. Rather, sanctifying grace adds something to original justice through the medium of the person. The result of this addition of sanctifying grace to the person is that the natural rectitude is supernaturalized. Reason and will now possess a supernatural orientation to God. Gallagher continues to observe that St. Thomas refers to sanctifying grace as the root of original justice. That's very important. He always comes back to Matthew Thomas to talk. It's the root of original justice. He also states that grace is so necessary for original justice that it cannot be formed without it. In fact, it cannot exist without grace. The reason for this is that sanctifying grace and original justice are indeed related as form to disposition. Original justice is a material dispositive cause for the reception of grace in the soul of man. It cannot exist without grace, as St. Thomas says, because it is caused by grace and demands grace. So the, in the relationship is such that the one depends upon the other for its, for its existence. And this is nothing else than the reciprocal causality which obtains between formal and material causes. And from this it is clear that St. Thomas relates preternatural rectitude to sanctifying grace in the actually existing supernaturalized person of Adam as matter and form, 
or as lower integrations relate to higher integrations, or as presuppositions relate to their final perfection. The union of both produced supernatural original justice. As persuasively argued by Gallagher, according to St. Thomas, the homo supernaturalis is, from the beginning, the true human being as originally intended by God. And now a brief word about this homo supernaturalis. The homo supernaturalis in the existential order of salvation history is nothing less than inchoately realized human teleology in its right original ordo. The triune God, who is love in act, is from the very beginning the efficient cause and the final end of this salvation historical ordo. St. Thomas states in his treatise on grace in the Prima Secunde, 100, question 113, article 2, God's love Dilectio Dei, considered on the part of the divine act, is eternal and unchangeable. Now the effect of the divine love in us is grace, whereby a human is made worthy of eternal life, from which sin shuts him out." Unquote. This effect of divine love in the homo supernaturalis is precisely the gift of original justice to specific human nature as such, the formal extrinsic root of which is sanctifying grace. As the Nigerian Dominican Father John Mark Ukehugu stated in his, in his very fine reasoned doctoral dissertation completed and defended at the Dominican House of Studies, I happen to be a reader of it, that's why I know it, states the following. The motive of God's action is always intrinsic since God as pure act is not actuated by something extrinsic to his being. Thus, the divine will by which God ordains things is not moved by something outside of God, but is the divine love, which is the principal act of the divine will." Unquote. On the part of God, divine love is the cause of the incarnation. On the part of humans, the effect of the incarnation is the remedy of sin and the restoration of the divine likeness. Analogously, on the part of God, divine love is the cause of the creation and integral constitution in supernatural original justice of the homo supernaturalis. On the part of the human, the effect is the divine likeness the inchoate communion with God, and the de facto ordination to the one surpassing final end, the beatific vision. Gifted with integral nature, elevated by sanctifying grace, the homo supernaturalis thus lives in an incipient communion with God, primordially caused by God, and constituted by the reciprocal form metacausality of sanctifying grace, and original justice in complete submission of intellect and will to God, and by all the other powers rightly ordered among each other and submitted to intellect and will. This existence has its apex in the very presence of the first cause in its supreme effect, namely the indwelling of the divine persons in the sanctified soul of the homo supernaturalis, and the latter beginning to live in God through acts of faith, hope, and charity. The divine likeness is brought about by the indwelling deity and its created effect, sanctifying grace and original justice, constituting reciprocally, like form and matter, the supernatural existence of the first parents in the life and love of God, a likeness to be increasingly perfected through acts of faith, hope, and charity, in ever greater deformity. It is nothing but the very life of God communicated to the sanctified soul of the first parents that actualizes the act of existence of the homo supernaturalis with a supernatural intensity characteristic of original justice 
that natural finitude and natural death are held at bay at present only in unrealized potency. The homo supernaturalis does not live in the horizon of and in the anticipation of his or her personal death. In communion of friendship with God, with a God who is infinite life himself, there occurs no actualization of the death characteristic of the decomposition of composite living beings. In short, integral nature is not finitized by the death of decomposition and the anticipation of this death during the life characteristic of rational animals. Rather, integral nature is finitized only by the participated act of being, which always entails a potency to the non-being and by entailment also the principle of defectability. That is the ever-present potency not to consider the rule and hence sin, to reduce and thus distort in light of some alleged alternative good the perfective freedom, the graced actualization of ever deeper union with the final end, life in God, to its skeletal condition, mere freedom of choice. Paradise puts into the modality of space and locality the preternatural effects of what is intrinsic to integral nature, elevated by grace. Incipient communion with and in God by way of a nature in which the proper order is realized in Choedli from the very beginning. Paradise is the effect of the quasi-supernatural strength given by God to the soul, an entailment of original justice, and through the soul radiating onto all parts of the human composite nature. Wherever integral nature obtains in the existential order of the person, there is paradise. And so the via salutis begins with a human being created by God, free from the beginning in the life of God, in the order of a paradisical peregrinatio of meritorious grace, in perfective freedom that would be completed in the beatific vision. While sin and death are absent from this primordial via salutis, their potency is not absent due to the principle of defectibility inherent to all created finite beings. The homo supernaturalis becomes visible, so to speak, only for the eyes of faith by way of revelation and its definitive witness, the Holy Scriptures. To the empirical sciences, paleoanthropology and paleogenetics, the salvation historical facticity of the Homo subordinaturalis has to remain an essentially hidden reality, as hidden as the creatio ex nihilo is from astrophysics, as the resurrection of Christ from critical historiography, and as the infusion of sanctifying grace from empirical psychology, all due to God's transcendent efficient causality, only traceable in those effects that are accountable to created secondary causality. That is what paleoanthropology and paleogenetics can trace and to a certain degree reconstruct with lesser or greater probability the conditions for the possibility of the non-contradiction, if not even compatibility between the deliveries of the natural sciences and the givens of the faith. The salvation historical truth and the theological significance can, however, only be accessed by way of divine revelation, by way of its inspired witness and through the eyes of faith. The salvation historical facticity of the homo supernaturalis can neither be proven nor disproven because the existence of the homo supernaturalis is the effect of a composite divine gift that is as such not traceable by the empirical sciences. The salvation historical facticity of the homo supernaturalis, indeed, as I already said earlier, remains hidden in God. Only the all-knowing revelation knows about what was in the beginning, 
And only with the calling of Abraham, the creation of Israel out of Egypt and through the desert into the people of God, does the revelation of the homo supernaturalis take shape, only to be definitively revealed through the incarnate Lord himself and the inspired apostolic witness about him, as, for example, in Romans 5. The hiddenness of the homo supernaturalis does not amount to an appeal to the god of the gaps, though. No god of the gaps. There is no gap here, but rather our encounter with a divine communication of an occasion of the causality of the transcendent first cause and those created secondary causes, original justice with all its preternatural entailments, sanctifying grace with the infused virtues of faith, hope, and charity, that do not leave any genetic trace after they have been forfeited. Looking for such traces is like examining the genetic code of Saint Therese of Lisieux in order to determine whether she died in a state of grace. It is simply a category mistake. To put it in the words of Charles Cardinal Chonet, one of the favorite theologians of Pope Paul VI, quote, the earthly paradise is no myth. It is the first effect of God's love for man, of the incomprehensible tenderness of his love. God conferred on him from the start the supernatural gift of sanctifying grace, which made him an adoptive son, in whom the divine persons might dwell. We might regard the first man as having been in a psychologically primitive state, very primitive even. He had, of course, his immortal soul, a great power of intuition, but complete absence of experience. And in this soul was original grace with its preternatural gifts, given, giving to the passions and instincts the sleep of love." Unquote. And Raisa Marita displays a theologically informed imagination very much in the spirit of St. John Henry Newman when she states, quote, There is nothing to stop us imagining the body of this man, she means the homo supernaturalis, free from all trace of degradation, as nearer to the primitive types. In spite of perhaps enormous distances of time, and ruling out the marks of degeneration these may have, nearer to the primitive types studied in prehistory and anthropology than to the developed types, which the canons of the Egyptian and Greek artists have taught us to consider as the supreme human exemplars." Unquote. If salvation history indeed embraces human history from beginning to end, and only if it does is it truly salvation history, then the Via Salutis begins with the Homo Supernaturalis as the all-knowing one revelation teaches, according to Aquinas, in light of its last and definitive word, the incarnate word himself, and his authoritative apostolic witness, Saint Paul. From the beginning it was not so, Jesus states in Matthew 19, 8, because in the beginning was the homo supernaturalis. In the beginning God made the human right, in right relation with God, in original grace, and hence worthy of eternal life. This right relation with God is from the beginning a created participation in the life of God, full communion in the act of love that is God. And this is a life of original charity, in original bliss and friendship with God. This is the divine likeness that was lost and that Christ came to restore in a surpassing and lasting way. It is this, the truth of the homo supernaturalis, that the Dr. Angelicus teaches, a teaching I would submit we cannot afford to ignore even today, a teaching that should ever more deeply inform our theological imagination so that we may be able to receive in an ever deeper way the teaching of Gaudium et Space 22. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>